We present Deborah Francis White Rolls the Dice, Episode 2, Saving Brother Ryan. Please welcome to the stage, Deborah Francis White. <laughs> So I landed in Canada in May 2015, and I was met at the airport by a man I didn't know. I had met him on the internet and agreed to stay at his house for a week. Just the two of us. Alone. And I know what you're thinking. Tinder is a wonderful thing. <laughs> but it wasn't like that. He was a virgin, and I wasn't. He was 23, and I wasn't. <laughs> He was a Jehovah's Witness, and I used to be. Well, I used to be a virgin. I know we all did, and I, I used to be 23, of course. But the thing is, technically, in May 2015, I was still a Jehovah's Witness, though I had left the religion and become an atheist many years before. Now, my parents decided we should become Jehovah's Witnesses when I was 14, presumably because they thought adolescence was an ideal time for brainwashing. And it is! <laughs> Your neuroplasticity is at its maximum then. Your brain is so open to washing, it creates its own spin cycle. <laughs> now, you should also know I was born and raised in Australia. I know I don't sound especially Australian, but I read a lot of Enid Blyton at the time, and I picked up the accent from the books. <laughs> As it is now compulsory for me to mention in this show. So before I can tell you this one properly, here's some revision on who the Jehovah's Witnesses are. They're the ones who knock on your door with the Watchtower magazine. Now, does anyone know why they come? No. <laughs> and yet they're so eager to tell you they've come to your house every two weeks since you were born. It's almost as if they're wasting their time. <laughs> it's because Armageddon is coming. And if you don't become a Jehovah's Witness in time, you'll be killed by God on that fiery judgment day. Also, Jehovah's Witnesses always refer to their religion as the truth, as in... How long have you been in the truth? <laughs> Everything else is referred to as the world, as in... When I was in the world, before I was in the truth. <laughs> because if you want to jail people, you need to use guns. But if you want people to jail themselves, you need to use words. <laughs> <laughs> Took the day off after I wrote that. <laughs> When I was 16, I really had no idea what I was getting myself into and when I wanted to leave. Well, you can't just leave. That's the thing. You cannot just walk out the door and say to the elders, the men who run your congregation, I don't want to be in this religion anymore. Not without being disfellowshipped, which means your friends have to shun you and cut you off, and even your family can only talk to you if absolutely necessary. And I mean they actually cross the road to avoid you if you've got deed. Oh, that's Jehovah's Witness slang, by the way, for being disfellowshipped. But she didn't know that Jehovah's Witnesses had street slang. <laughs> the cool kids do. The rebels, they'd say... You hear what happens to Matty? He got deed. <laughs> now, I worried I might get disfellowshipped when my Radio 4 show came out because I still have other family who are witnesses. But I wasn't because it has to be done by your congregation, and I don't have one anymore. Unless I reconnect with my old congregation, I'm like a bulletproof fugitive permanently outside the law of the elders. <laughs> so when the first series of the Radio 4 show came out, I had a lot of messages from former Jehovah's Witnesses. You're an actual funny ex-Jehovah's Witness. You should write our Book of Mormon. <laughs> And messages from former Jehovah's Witnesses that I actually knew. Oh, Deb, I couldn't believe it when I heard you on the radio. All these years, I totally believed it was the truth. And when I heard your show, well, I started to laugh. I realised it was ridiculous. But you've been out for years, haven't you, Lizzie? You're disfellowshipped. Yeah, but I felt guilty every day. Knew if I didn't go back that I'd die at Armageddon. That Jehovah God would kill me in a horrible, painful death because I was unrighteous and he was loving. Yeah, it's hard to see... <laughs> I didn't realise it was funny before now, really. If your show had been serious, I never would have listened. It was just that it was comedy, so I figured, hey, what harm can it do? Yeah, and then I woke up. <laughs> See, light entertainment can do heavy lifting. <laughs> but in all this, I only got one message from a current Jehovah's Witness. My name is Ryan, and I'm writing to you from Vancouver uh, about your comedy show, Deborah Francis White Rolls the Dice, which I heard on the BBC. I'm a pioneer in Canada. Being a pioneer is like being Jehovah's Witness Special Branch. I was a pioneer. It's the cultiest bit of a very culty cult. <laughs> I just realised I'm in a cult, and I don't know what to do. I need to get out, but 
How did you do it without being Deed? It was when he said Deed that I knew he was one of the cool kids. <laughs> the elders are trying to get me into a committee meeting because they're suspicious, because I'm a pioneer and I've just gone off the radar. They, they think I'm waking up and might have turned apostate. Oh, my God. Don't go into that committee meeting. Don't get into that room. I know. They're calling me day and night. They're waiting out front of my apartment. I'm having to slip out the back to avoid them. Leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses can feel a lot like being Walter White in Breaking Bad. <laughs> Your brother-in-law is the cops, and you spend a lot of time hiding in an RV in the middle of the desert trying to escape from bad guys. <laughs> OK, I'll help you. I did it, I know what to do. And you're only 23, this is exciting, right? You've got your whole life ahead of you. You don't have to knock on doors in a badly fitting suit anymore. You can be anything, do anything. Yeah, I guess. Why do you guess? I don't know, I guess I don't feel hopeful. Sign of depression. Are you depressed, Ryan? I don't know. Have you been depressed? Yes. I just had to roll the dice. Ryan, how would you feel if I came out and helped you get out? To Vancouver? Yes. But you live in London. I would have to get on a plane. <laughs> we could work out a plan together. It would be fun. What do you think? That would be amazing. And there it was. I heard hope in his voice. Now, because Ryan had heard me on the BBC, I'll be honest and say I think he'd got the impression that I was more famous than I am. <laughs> I think he thought I was like Graham Norton or someone and I didn't disabuse him because why ruin it for everyone? <laughs> Now, the governing body, who are the seven old men in the Brooklyn Jehovah's Witness headquarters who run the cult, are the ones who encourage quick disfellowshipping for anyone they think might have woken up and worked out that it isn't the truth that their word is law because they cannot have that idea going viral. And whenever they change their word, that new word is equally law. So you can be disfellowshipped for having any kind of theological debate or even musing. The image of the wild beast in the Bible book of Revelation, well, I know the current understanding... Brother Alan, it sounds like you've been doing some independent thinking. <laughs> Just to be clear, independent thinking is an official sin. <laughs> Any time the Watchtower Society want to change the thought, they call it new light, as in Jehovah God has shed some new light on this scripture, and now we have a new understanding. Often they do a complete 180. You cannot have a kidney transplant. New light! You can have a kidney transplant, as long as it doesn't involve a blood transfusion. Already dead? We will not apologise. That was God revealing new light. Can't have a blood transfusion for an operation? New light can have blood fragments, if that helps. Already dead? Sorry, not sorry. That was new light, not our problem, dead dude. <laughs> This odd policy is based on a scripture in Proverbs 4 that says the bright light is getting lighter and lighter as the day draws nearer and nearer. Sure, but if you're in a dim room and you can't read the pages of your book and you turn up the dimmer switch, the book doesn't suddenly turn into a dog, does it? <laughs> so any time the governing body of the Watchtower Society, who run your life and own your life when you're a Jehovah's Witness, want to change anything, do a 180 or explain why Armageddon hasn't come for the fifth time in a crappily produced predicted row, it's just brought to you by our sponsors, New Light. New Light, for when you've ruined people's lives, but you need them to think it was their fault. <laughs> so I arrive in Vancouver, and Ryan is there at arrivals to meet me. I, I didn't think you'd come. Well, I didn't know if you'd come. Uh, I, I thought you'd come, but I thought you might not come, you know. I came. Right. I thought you might not come. <laughs> So I was thinking, while I'm here, we should do one thing every day that you couldn't do when you're a Jehovah's Witness. Wow, that'd be great, so great. I thought you might not come. <laughs> so what do you want to do with your life once we've managed to find a strategy to get you past the elders? Uh, I want to do what you do, comedy, or make independent movies. Well, you're more likely to do those things after you've been a Jehovah's Witness, I think. Why? People think doing stand-up comedy is scary. We've sold the Bible door to door, mate. They don't know what scary is. <laughs> I mean, at least these people have left the house. <laughs> what was the scariest thing that ever happened to you when you were door knocking? A guy in a clown suit pulled a gun on me. <laughs> right, so hecklers can sod off. <laughs> now you're the clown with the gun. What do you mean? A comedy improv class, you can be whatever you want. Let's go. Brought to you by New Light. New Light! For when you need to blame your followers for following your instructions. <laughs> 
Women aren't allowed to speak at the meetings at the Kingdom Hall. Well, they're not allowed to speak from the platform or pulpit, but there's a loophole. Every Sunday, one of the elders, who in real life, by the way, has not been to theological college, they're usually plumbers, electricians or window washers. Nothing wrong with those jobs, but no special reason why you'd let those service providers tell you who it is appropriate to date. So one of the plumbers would get up on the stage, read a paragraph from the Watchtower magazine, and then one of the window washers would ask the audience the question at the bottom of the page. And then anyone in the congregation, women included, could answer it. You were meant to put it into your own words to show you'd understood it. And I thought, OK, I will put it into my own words. And my personal metric for success became how many times I could get called upon to answer and how many laughs I could get. <laughs> so the paragraph would say something like... At the upcoming convention, a faithful worshipper of Jehovah would not focus on superficial matters like their choice of clothing. Some have paid too much attention to dressing up when they would do well to dress modestly and concentrate on the spiritual food. And the question would say... What should a faithful worshipper of Jehovah focus on at the upcoming convention? And I'd put my hand up and say, I think the next convention is called the Divine Peace Convention, not the Divine Fashion Convention. Am I right, sisters? Now, I'm aware that's not funny to you. But in the Mermaid Beach Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses, that killed. <laughs> Also, women, always called sisters, were allowed to do little plays at one of the meetings to demonstrate we were learning how to talk to people at the doors. And these were very unrealistic because they always went like this. Good morning. I was wondering if you ever worried about the future. Why, sure I do. <laughs> the Bible has some interesting answers to the world's problems. Really? Why don't you come inside? I'd love to hear what the Bible has to say. And I worked out that Jehovah's Witnesses found nothing funnier than taking the piss out of the born-again Christians. <laughs> if you made the householder a born-again Christian who wasn't very bright and you asked them questions revealing they didn't know much about the Bible, you brought the house down. <laughs> I was invited to tour that show and take it to the big football stadium conventions. It got such big laughs. And that's when I got addicted to comedy, playing Jehovah's Witness football stadium conventions. <laughs> I started with stadium comedy. Think of me as a Michael McIntyre in reverse. <laughs> then I started a secret underground Jehovah's Witness comedy improv troupe. Sort of like a whose eternal life is it anyway. <laughs> Brought to you by New Light. New Light. If you can't change what you say, change what what you say means. <laughs> So Ryan and I did an improv class. Improv class is a great place to meet girls, Ryan. Uh, I'm not, I don't, yeah, that scares me. What? Can we talk about that stuff? I didn't think you'd come. <laughs> okay, how far have you gone? Have you had a kiss? No, you know we're not allowed to do that unless we're courting with a view to marriage. Mmm, sexy. <laughs> Are you straight? I think so. OK, well, that makes it a tiny bit harder to get started. But I can... <laughs> but I can teach you. What? Uh, no, not in that way. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to have your first kiss at 23. There, there's an expectation you know what you're doing. Oh, I know. However old you think I was, when I got started, I was older. Oh, OK. Well, can you teach my friends as well? There are more of you. Deborah, this is Jim and Owen. Hey. Hi, Jim and Owen. We have questions. What is a move? What? A move. I have heard you need to make one if you want to be with a woman. <laughs> I do not know how to make a move. I do not know what a move is. Like, do you just say, may I kiss you now, please, miss? What? When? This is what I'm asking. Uh, when do you say that? Okay, let's role play. Uh, I've seen that on the internet, and I'm not sure I'm ready for that. <laughs> not sexy dress-up role play, just the part where you meet someone. Jim, let's pretend we're at a party and we're having a fun conversation. Okay, uh... So, do you watch Game of Thrones? I do, and I haven't seen this series, so no spoilers. Oh, you're behind. You're not a real fan. I guess not. I'm, I'm thirsty, though. I really want a drink. Uh, the bar is over there. Okay, Freeze. 
<laughs> Freeze. Uh, now I think you're not interested, or you'd say, let's get a drink, and, and you'd come with me. But if I say that, she's going to think I want to kiss her. And do you want to kiss her? Yeah. <laughs> then it's OK she knows that. Oh, I, I never thought of that. Yeah, this is good stuff. We should be writing this down. <laughs> Jehovah's Witness Dating School went on for six hours. Brought to you by New Light. New Light. For when you're a lying liar and want to lie about that. <laughs> so Ryan and I did one new thing every day. Lots of things Ryan couldn't do before. We did comedy improv, we did XJW Dating School, we did magic mushrooms. <laughs> Actually, we did an hallucinogenic drug. I am not endorsing the use of drugs here, just to be clear. I am definitely not recommending or enabling. The BBC is not endorsing drugs. <laughs> Ryan wanted to try a drug because he'd never done a drug before. So we met a friend of his called Parker, who he'd met on an XJW website, who'd recommended this highly legal drug to us as something that would open him up. Parker said... There you go. Now, don't take too much. I'm going to go now. What? Why? Where? I have to go and see my mom. I can't get high. Sure, but just come while we take it. Why? Because Ryan is a virgin, and salvia affects your brain chemistry, and I am very helpful. <laughs> and? And Ryan is a 23-year-old virgin, and I know what he needs help with, and if we take this stuff alone at his place, I might just volunteer to help him, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Not in a sexy way, more in the spirit of Great British Bake Off. <laughs> Show him a technical signature and a showstopper. Uh-huh. I'm trying to help him out of a cult. I don't want him to wake up in the morning feeling he's joined a much creepier cult. OK, I'll come and hang with you guys. So Parker came to hang. So, just take this, no more. And we did. And we were on the ceiling. Is this my hand? Is this my hand? Is this my hand? Is this my hand? <laughs> Can I reiterate that this was all incredibly legal and I don't recommend it? OK, so I have to go. There's more there, but don't take any more tonight. Leave it for another time. Shall we take more? I think we should. <laughs> and we just sat and looked at each other. And he just wanted to hold my hands. And there was no Great British Bake Off moment because as Ryan looked into my eyes, I realised I was the first person he'd ever really seen. He'd had no proper normal teenage physical connection. You don't even do normal adolescent best friend hugs. He can't touch a guy, he might be gay, he can't touch a girl, he might get an erection. So you never really properly look at anyone. So as I looked into his eyes, I saw myself. All those years with a frozen middle, an island, isolated, devoid, in pain, holding hands with my old self, letting myself thaw a little more as I remembered watching this boy thaw and open up to becoming a man. And then our jaws started to clench. <laughs> now, sometimes if you take something, your inhibitors come down and your jaw clamps a little, but our jaws were clamping a lot. What's happening? What's happening? Don't worry, it's all completely normal, man. <laughs> it wasn't. Our jaws were really locked tight shut. At this point, certain sexual demonstrations really were out of the question. <laughs> I'd have bitten it right off. <laughs> it's fine. All you do is you suck your finger. It takes the pressure right off the back teeth. Now, in the state I was in, I really believed that this was received wisdom and something I'd seen cool people do. No big deal. The next day, I realised I'd never heard of it or seen of it before. <laughs> but there is a weird high wisdom in it. It does work. So we sat there sucking our fingers, releasing our pain, until Ryan said... But, Deborah, now we're not holding hands anymore. Don't worry, Ryan. You can suck my finger, and I can suck yours. That's a great idea. <laughs> Brought to you by New Light. New Light! For when the lies you've told just got old. <laughs> a Jehovah's Witness, your life is run exclusively by men, specifically the elders who administer the rules, the new light and the justice of the governing body. It's like living in a 3D picture book called the Patriarchy Rules. There's no disagreeing with the powerful men and even if you don't disagree with them, if there's a crucible style rumour about you, you're taken into the back room of the Kingdom Hall and three window washers ask you a series of questions. Women who've been molested are routinely asked... Did you enjoy it? Did you lead him on? What were you wearing? Have you ever watched pornography? Who took 
off your underwear, did he or did you? And sometimes, as Parker said... They ask me questions only your doctor should ask you. I try not to think about it because they don't run my life anymore and my brain doesn't know the difference between being in the committee room and reimagining it. But I notice I get really easily cowed by angry men and try my best to please them. I'm very helpful. So the elders were circling in on Ryan, on the phone, on email, outside of his apartment. The cover story was that I was his aunt, otherwise he could be disfellowshipped just for having me in the house overnight, even if nothing went on. And to be fair to them, there had been a rather sordid finger-sucking episode. <laughs> and it was then that I came up with a brilliant plan. We should go to the Kingdom Hall, to a meeting. On Sunday. Are you insane? Not your meeting, a neighbouring Kingdom Hall. The elders have no power to disfellowship you there. But someone will recognise you and the rumour mill will work and it will get back to your elders that you were at a meeting and that should buy you a couple of weeks. If it works, it's brilliant. I've brought a mid-calf A-line skirt in case this happened. <laughs> I walk into the Kingdom Hall for the first time since the 90s. My heart is beating. We sit down. We open the Bible to look up scriptures as the brother gives the public talk. I think I will have forgotten where they are, but my muscle memory works. Ezekiel, no problem. Colossians, right here, my friend. Titus. Titus? I've forgotten there's a book called Titus. Isn't that a Shakespeare play? Is this a test? Oh, my God, it's a test. They'll know. I'll be rumbled. They'll know I'm not your aunt, a devout Jehovah's Witness. They'll know. They'll go, oh, thank God, here's Titus. <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly, there's a man standing over me. Ryan, we need to speak to you at the back of the Kingdom Hall right now. I'm in a meeting right now. This is unheard of. You'd never pull anyone out of a meeting. Something's gone wrong. Do not leave this meeting without talking to the elders. The man walks away. Ryan looks behind him, panicked. You've got to get out of here. I'll wait for the song. Then I'll pretend I'm going to the bathroom, and at the last minute, I'll make a run for it. The song began. He got up and walked away. There was the closing prayer, and then I got up to go. Just head for the door. Don't look left or right. And then an elderly sister leapt out in front of me. Are you a visiting sister? Yes, but I've got to go oh, now. Oh, where are you visiting from? London. London, Ontario? No, London, England. Oh, I love that downtown abbey. Is that in London? <laughs> Four old sisters later, I get to the first lot of doors. Where are you going? We need to talk to you. Are you looking for Ryan? We've already talked to Ryan. Now we need to talk to you. They might have him. I have to follow them. Also, I know what to say. I was an excellent Jehovah's Witness. I can buy him some time. I follow them into a back room. It's a totally closed off room with no windows. One of the elders locks the door and stands with his back to it. I am in a locked room with two men I've never met. So, you're Ryan's aunt, eh? From London, eh? Yes. <laughs> Why wouldn't Ryan come into the back room with us? Well, it's all a bit FBI, isn't it? Nothing. <laughs> they just stared. We love Ryan. And when you love someone, you worry about them. And Ryan hasn't returned our call. Of course. I think he's just going through some things. We I think... love Ryan. So we need to talk to him. I totally understand that. I think maybe the most loving thing you can do right now is give him some space. He's just working out how he feels. How's about Ryan's friends? Honestly, anything I could tell you would just be gossip. We're a couple of elders. You can tell us anything. This is the first time they've explained who they are. And the point at which one looks at the other right in front of me is if to say, we've got her now. I really don't think Jehovah would want me to pass on rumours. It would be against my Bible-trained conscience. <laughs> this is the Jehovah's Witness equivalent of pleading the fifth. There's no comeback to this. <laughs> they look furious that I've used this loophole. <laughs> Ryan came with me to a meeting today, and, and, you know, that's encouraging, isn't it? I'm sure he'll come back to you and to Jehovah in his own time if you just give him some space. The interrogation continues for another 25 minutes until... So you're from London? Yes. What congregation? OK, this I am not prepared for. I've prepped all the Ryan stuff, but nothing about me. I just blurt out my last London congregation. Pimlico! And who's the coordinator there? OK, this wasn't a job when I was a witness. We had a presiding overseer. Coordinator is new light. New light for when you need to keep changing the details so you can make sure who's still drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. Huh. Name any elder. And I think it's over. It's over. I can't, I'm not, I'm not going to know an elder. But then, from nowhere, my brain digs deep and offers me Toby Montague Jones. He's a major elder. Whenever there's trouble about blood transfusions, they put him on the telly because he's posh. 
What's his phone number? I don't think he can help you. He doesn't know Ryan. I need to ask him about you. I need to do a background check on you. And that's it. I've put up with this for half an hour, and now no more. I stand up. This is why it seems like you're from the FBI. This is why you don't seem loving. This is why Ryan doesn't want to talk to you. This is why no one wants to talk to you. You are two men and you think it's perfectly normal to lock a woman in a room and interrogate her. It's not occurred to you that it's immoral and frightening and very probably illegal. Now unlock this door because I'm leaving. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And I walk out the door and I walk out of the Kingdom Hall. And I'm free, and I start to run. And all I can think is, how did they know I wasn't a Jehovah's Witness? Because they absolutely knew for certain, and I'd looked right, and I'd used all the right language. I was perfect. How did they know? And I realize I didn't look submissive. A sister wouldn't do that. She wouldn't look the elders in the eye and offer them advice. She'd look at the floor, and if they spoke to her like that, she'd cry. She'd be expected to break. I wasn't a plausible Jehovah's Witness anymore, because I couldn't look submissive. And then I remembered that now they had my last congregation... There was somewhere to disfellowship me from. I had tried to save Brother Ryan, and all I had done was get myself captured. And then I realised, in all the time they'd spent interrogating me, they'd forgotten to ask my name. (laughs) When I got on the plane to go home, I realised that people would think it was terrible I'd been locked in the back room of a Kingdom Hall against my will for half an hour. But in truth... I'd been locked in the back room of the Kingdom Hall against my will for all these years, right up until I'd said, unlock the door and let me out. My whole life has changed in the year since I walked out that door. I'm free, living in the glow of a new light. I still meet angry men, but it isn't my job to please them all the time, and I'm a lot less helpful. (laughs) Now, Ryan and I, we are both doing independent thinking. Ryan isn't depressed anymore. He's hopeful. We have left the truth and found our truth. We are worldly because the whole world is ours. I want to write comedy. You want to write some jokes for my new radio show about you? New light for when it's not the end of the world. But you promised it would be. (laughs) Oh, uh, and I met a girl. Technical signature and a showstopper? Damn straight. (laughs) Brought to you by New Light. New Light for when the old light seemed a lot like a big dark hole. You've been listening to Deborah Francis White Rolls the Dice, written and performed by Deborah Francis White, Nips and Tucks by Ryan Morse, with additional performances by Alex Lowe, Lawrence Dobiesch, and Margaret Caborn Smith. The producer was Alan Nixon, and the show was a So Radio production for BBC Radio 4. And that was.